Chapter Thirteen of Varney the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Varney the Vampire, Volume One, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter Thirteen: The Offer for the Hall. The Visit to Sir Francis Varney. The Strange Resemblance. A Dreadful Suggestion. The party made a strict search through every nook and corner of the garden, but it proved to be a fruitless one. Not the least trace of any one could be found. There was only one circumstance which was pondered over deeply by them all, and that was that beneath the window of the room in which Flora and her mother sat while the brothers were on their visit to the vault of their ancestors were visible marks of blood to a considerable extent. It will be remembered that Flora had fired a pistol at the spectral appearance, and that immediately upon that it had disappeared, after uttering a sound which might well be construed into a cry of pain from a wound. That a wound then had been inflicted upon someone, the blood beneath the window now abundantly testified, and when it was discovered, Henry and Charles made a very close examination indeed of the garden, to discover what direction the wounded figure, be it man or vampire, had taken. But the closest scrutiny did not reveal to them a single spot of blood beyond the space immediately beneath the window. There the apparition seemed to have received its wound, and then, by some mysterious means, to have disappeared. At length, wearied with the continued excitement, combined with want of sleep to which they had been subjected, they returned to the hall. Flora, with the exception of the alarm she experienced from the firing of the pistol, had met with no disturbance, and that in order to spare her painful reflections, they told her was merely done as a precautionary measure, to proclaim to anyone who might be lurking in the garden that the inmates of the house were ready to defend themselves against any aggression. Whether or not she believed this kind deceit, they knew not. She only sighed deeply and wept. The probability is that she more than suspected the vampire had made another visit, but they forbore to press the point, and leaving her with her mother, Henry and George went from her chamber again, the former to endeavor to seek some repose, as it would be his turn to watch on the succeeding night, and the latter to resume his station in a small room close to Flora's chamber, where it had been agreed watch and ward should be kept by turns while the alarm lasted. At length the morning again dawned upon that unhappy family, and to none were its beams more welcome. The birds sang their pleasant carols beneath the window. The sweet, deep-colored autumnal sun shone upon all objects with the golden luster, and to look abroad upon the beaming face of nature no one could for a moment suppose, except from sad experience, that there were such things as gloom, misery, and crime upon the earth. "'And must I,' said Henry, as he gazed from a window of the hall upon the undulating park, the majestic trees, the flowers, the shrubs, and the many natural beauties with which the place was full, "'must I be chased from this spot, the home of myself and my kindred, by a phantom? Must I indeed seek refuge elsewhere, because my own home has become hideous?' It was indeed a cruel and painful thought but it was one he yet would not, could not be convinced was absolutely necessary. But now the sun was shining, it was morning, and the feelings, which found a home in his breast amid the darkness, the stillness, and the uncertainty of night, were chased away by those glorious beams of sunlight that fell upon hill, valley, and stream, and the thousand sweet sounds of life and animation that filled that sunny air. Such a revulsion of feeling was natural enough. Many of the distresses and mental anxieties of night vanish with the night, and those which oppressed the heart of Henry Bannerworth were considerably modified. He was engaged in these reflections when he heard the sound of the lodge bell, and as a visitor was now somewhat rare at this establishment, he waited with some anxiety to see to whom he was indebted for so early a call. In the course of a few minutes, one of the servants came to him with a letter in her hand. 
It bore a large, handsome seal, and from its appearance would seem to have come from some personage of consequence. A second glance at it showed him the name of Varney in the corner, and with some degree of vexation he muttered to himself, "'Another condoling epistle from the troublesome neighbor whom I have not yet seen.' "'If you please, sir,' said the servant who had brought in the letter, "'as I'm here, and you are here, perhaps you'll have no objection to give me what I'm to have for the day and two nights as I've been here.' "'cause I can't stay in the family as is so familiar with all sorts of ghostesses. I ain't used to such company.' "'What do you mean?' said Henry. The question was a superfluous one. Too well he knew what the woman meant, and the conviction came across his mind strongly that no domestic would consent to live long in a house which was subject to such dreadful visitations. "'What does I mean?' said the woman. "'Why, sir,' "'If it's all the same to you, I don't myself come from a wampire family, "'and I don't choose to remain in a house where there is such things encouraged. "'That's what I mean, sir.' "'What wages are owing to you?' said Henry. "'Why, as to wages, I only come here by the day.' "'Go, then, and settle with my mother. "'The sooner you leave this house, the better.' "'Oh, indeed, I'm sure I don't want to stay.' This woman was one of those who were always armed at all points for a row, and she had no notion of concluding any engagement, of any character whatever, without some disturbance. Therefore, to see Henry take what she said with such provoking calmness was aggravating in the extreme. But there was no help for such a source of vexation. She could find no other ground of quarrel than what was connected with the vampire, and as Henry would not quarrel with her on such a score, she was compelled to give it up in despair. When Henry found himself alone and free from the annoyance of this woman, he turned his attention to the letter he held in his hand, and which, from the autograph in the corner, he knew came from his new neighbor, Sir Francis Varney, whom, by some chance or another, he had never yet seen. To his great surprise, he found that the letter contained the following words. Dear Sir, as a neighbor, by purchase of an estate contiguous to your own, I am quite sure you have excused and taken in good part the cordial offer I made to you of friendship and service some short time since. But now, in addressing to you a distinct proposition, I trust I shall meet with an indulgent consideration, whether such a proposition be accordant with your views or not. What I have heard from common report induces me to believe that Bannerworth Hall cannot be a desirable residence for yourself or your amiable sister. If I am right in that conjecture, and you have any serious thought of leaving the place, I would earnestly recommend you, as one having some experience in such descriptions of property, to sell it at once. Now the proposition with which I conclude this letter is, I know of a character to make you doubt the disinterestedness of such advice, but that it is disinterested, nevertheless, is a fact of which I can assure my own heart, and of which I beg to assure you. I propose, then, should you, upon consideration, decide upon such a course of proceeding to purchase of you the hall. I do not ask for a bargain on account of any extraneous circumstances which may at the present time depreciate the value of the property, but I am willing to give a fair price for it. Under these circumstances, I trust, sir, that you will give a kindly consideration to my offer, and even if you reject it, I hope that, as neighbors, we may live on in peace and amity, and in the interchange of those good offices which should subsist between us. Awaiting your reply, believe me to be, dear sir, your very obedient servant, Francis Varney. To Henry Bannerworth, Esquire. Henry, after having read this most unobjectionable letter through, folded it up again, and placed it in his pocket. Clasping his hands then behind his back, a favorite attitude of his when he was in deep contemplation, he paced to and fro in the garden for some time in deep thought. "'How strange,' he muttered. "'It seems that every circumstance combines to induce me to leave my old ancestral home.' It appears as if everything now that happened had that direct tendency. What can be the meaning of all this? Tis very strange, amazingly strange. 
Here arise circumstances which are enough to induce any man to leave a particular place. Then a friend, in whose single-mindedness and judgment I know I can rely, advise that step, and immediately upon the back of that comes a fair and candid offer. There was an apparent connection between all these circumstances which much puzzled Henry. He walked to and fro for nearly an hour, until he heard a hasty footstep approaching him, and upon looking in the direction from whence it came, he saw Mr. Marchdale. "'I will seek Marchdale's advice,' he said, upon this matter. "'I will hear what he says concerning it.' "'Henry!' said Marchdale, when he came sufficiently near to him for conversation. Why do you remain here alone? I have received a communication from our neighbor, Sir Francis Varney, said Henry. Indeed. It is here. Peruse it for yourself, and then tell me, Marchdale, candidly, what you think of it. I suppose, said Marchdale, as he opened the letter, it is another friendly note of condolence on the state of your domestic affairs, which, I grieve to say, from the prattling of domestics, whose tongues it is quite impossible to silence, have become the food for gossip all over the neighboring villages and estates. If anything could add another pang to those I have already been made to suffer, said Henry, it would certainly arise from being made the food of vulgar gossip. But read the letter, Marchdale you'll find its contents of a more important character than you anticipate. Indeed, said Marchdale, as he ran his eyes eagerly over the note. When he had finished it, he glanced at Henry, who then said, Well, what is your opinion? I know not what to say, Henry. You know that my own advice to you had been to get rid of this place. It has with the hope that the disagreeable affair connected with it now may remain connected with it as a house, and not with you and yours as a family. It may be so. There appears to me every likelihood of it. I do not know, said Henry with a shudder. I must confess, Marchdale, that to my own perceptions it seems more probably that the infliction we have experienced from the strange visitor, who seems now resolved to pester us with visits, will rather attach to a family than to a house. The vampire may follow us. If so, of course the parting with the hall would be a great pity, and no gain. None in the least. Henry, a thought has struck me. Let's hear it, Marchdale. It is this. Suppose you were to try the experiment of leaving the hall without selling it. Suppose for one year you were to let it to someone, Henry. It might be done. Aye, and it might, with very great promise and candor, be proposed to this very gentleman, Sir Francis Varney, to take it for one year to see how he likes it before becoming the possessor of it. Then, if he found himself tormented by the vampire, he need not complete the purchase, or, if you have found that the apparition followed you from hence, you might yourself return, feeling that perhaps here, in the spots familiar to your youth, you might be most happy, even under such circumstances as at present oppress you. Most happy, ejaculated Henry. Perhaps I should not have used that word. I am sure you should not, said Henry, when you speak of me. Well, well, let us hope that the time may not be far distant when I may use the term happy as applied to you in the most conclusive and the strongest manner it can be used. Oh, said Henry, I will hope, but do not mock me with it now, Marchdale, I pray you. Heaven forbid that I should mock you. Well, well, I do not believe you are the man to do so to anyone but about the affair of the house. Distinctly, then, if I were you, I would call upon Sir Francis Varney and make him an offer to become a tenant of the hall for twelve months, during which time you could go where you please and test the fact of absence ridding you or not ridding you of the dreadful visitant who makes the night here truly hideous. I will speak to my mother, to George, and to my sister of the matter. They shall decide." Mr. Marchdale now strove in every possible manner to raise the spirits of Henry Bannerworth by painting to him the future in far more radiant colors than the present, 
and endeavoring to induce a belief in his mind that a short period of time might, after all, replace in his mind, and the minds of those who were naturally so dear to him, all their wanted serenity. Henry, although he felt not much comfort from these kindly efforts, yet could feel gratitude to him who made them, and after expressing such a feeling to Marchdale, in strong terms, he repaired to the house in order to hold a solemn consultation with those whom he felt ought to be consulted, as well as himself, as to what steps should be taken with regard to the hall. The proposition, or rather the suggestion, which had been made by Marchdale upon the proposition of Sir Francis Varney, was in every respect so reasonable and just that it met, as was to be expected, with the concurrence of every member of the family. Flora's cheeks almost resumed some of their wanted color at the mere thought now of leaving that home to which she had been at one time so much attached. "'Yes, dear Henry,' she said, let us leave here if you are agreeable to do so, and in leaving this house we will believe that we leave behind us a world of terror. Flora, remarked Henry in a tone of slight reproach, if you were so anxious to leave Bannerworth Hall, why did you not say so before this proposition came from other mouths? You know your feelings upon such a subject would have been laws to me. I knew you were attached to the old house, said Flora. And besides, events have come upon us all with such fearful rapidity, there has scarcely been time to think. True, true. And you will leave, Henry? I will call upon Sir Francis Varney myself and speak to him upon the subject. A new impetus to existence appeared now to come over the whole family at the idea of leaving a place which always would be now associated in their minds with so much terror. Each member of the family felt happier, and breathed more freely than before, so that the change which had come over them seemed almost magical. And Charles Holland, too, was much better pleased, and he whispered to Flora, Dear Flora, you will now surely no longer talk of driving from you the honest heart that loves you? Hush, Charles, hush, she said. Meet me in an hour hence in the garden, and we will talk of this. "'That hour will seem an age,' he said. Henry, now having made a determination to see Sir Francis Varney, lost no time in putting it into execution. At Mr. Marchdale's own request, he took him with him, as it was desirable to have a third person present in the sort of business negotiation which was going on. The estate which had been so recently entered upon by the person calling himself Sir Francis Varney, and which common report said he had purchased, was a small but complete property, and situated so close to the grounds connected with Bannerworth Hall, that a short walk soon placed Henry and Mr. Marchdale before the residence of this gentleman who had shown so kindly a feeling towards the Bannerworth family. "'Have you seen Sir Francis Varney?' asked Henry of Mr. Marchdale, as he rung the gate bell. "'I have not. Have you?' "'No, I never saw him. It is rather awkward our both being absolute strangers to his person. We can but send in our names, however, and from the great vein of courtesy that runs through his letter, I have no doubt but we shall receive the most gentlemanly reception from him. A servant in handsome livery appeared at the iron gates, which opened upon a lawn in the front of Sir Francis Varney's house, and to this domestic Henry Bannerworth handed his card, on which he had written in pencil, likewise the name of Mr. Marchdale. "'If your master,' he said, "'is within, we shall be glad to see him.' "'Sir Francis is at home, sir,' was the reply, "'although not very well.' If you will be pleased to walk in, I will announce you to him. Henry and Marchdale followed the man into a handsome enough reception room where they were desired to wait while their names were announced. Do you know if this gentleman be a baronet, said Henry, or a knight merely? I really do not. I never saw him in my life or heard of him before he came into this neighborhood. "'And I have been too much occupied with the painful occurrences of this hall "'to know anything of our neighbors. "'I dare say Mr. Chillingworth, if we had thought to ask him, "'would have known something concerning him.' "'No doubt.' 
This brief colloquy was put an end to by the servant, who said, My master, gentlemen, is not very well, but he begs me to present his best compliments, and to say he is much gratified with your visit, and will be happy to see you in his study. Henry and Marchdale followed the man up a flight of stone stairs, and then they were conducted through a large apartment into a smaller one. There was very little light in this small room, but at the moment of their entrance a tall man, who was seated, rose, and, touching the spring of a blind that was to the window, it was up in a moment, admitting a broad glare of light. A cry of surprise mingled with terror came from Henry Bannerworth's lip. The original of the portrait on the panel stood before him. There was the lofty stature, the long, sallow face, the slightly projecting teeth, the dark, lustrous, although somewhat somber eyes, the expression of the features, all were alike. "'Are you unwell, sir?' said Sir Francis Varney, in soft, mellow accents, as he handed a chair to the bewildered Henry. "'God of heaven!' said Henry. "'How like!' "'You seem surprised, sir. Have you ever seen me before?' Sir Francis drew himself up to his full height, and cast a strange glance upon Henry, whose eyes were riveted upon his face, as if with a species of fascination which he could not resist. "'Marchdale!' Henry gasped. "'Marchdale, my friend, Marchdale! I—I I am surely mad!' "'Hush! Be calm!' whispered Marchdale. "'Calm! Calm! Can you not see?' "'Marchdale, is this a dream? "'Look! "'Look! "'Oh, look! "'For God's sake, Henry, compose yourself.' "'Is your friend often thus?' said Sir Francis Varney, with the same mellifluous tone which seemed habitual with him. "'No, sir, he is not, but recent circumstances have shattered his nerves, and to tell the truth, you bear so strong a resemblance to an old portrait in his house—' that I do not wonder so much as I otherwise should at his agitation. Indeed. A resemblance, said Henry, a resemblance. God of heaven, it is the face itself. You much surprise me, said Sir Francis. Henry sunk into the chair which was near him, and he trembled violently. The rush of painful thoughts and conjectures that came through his mind was enough to make anyone tremble. "'Is this the vampire?' was the horrible question that seemed impressed upon his very brain in letters of flame. "'Is this the vampire?' "'Are you better, sir?' said Sir Francis Varney, in his bland musical voice. "'Shall I order refreshment for you?' "'No, no.' gasped Henry. For the love of truth, tell me. Is, is your name really Varney? Sir? Have you no other name to which, perhaps, a better title you could urge? Mr. Bannerworth, I can assure you that I am too proud of the name of the family to which I belong to exchange it for any other, be it what it may. How wonderfully like! I grieve to see you so much distressed, Mr. Bannerworth. I presume ill health has thus shattered your nerves? No, ill health has not done the work. I know not what to say, Sir Francis Varney, to you, but recent events in my family have made the sight of you full of horrible conjectures. What mean you, sir? You know, from common report, that we have had a fearful visitor at our house. A vampire, I have heard, said Sir Francis Varney, with a bland and almost beautiful smile, which displayed his white, glistening teeth to perfection. Yes, a vampire, and, and... I pray you go on, sir. You surely are above the vulgar superstition of believing in such matters. My judgment is assailed in too many ways and shapes for it to hold out probably as it ought to do against so hideous a belief but never was it so much bewildered as now. Why so? Because. Nay, Henry, whispered Mr. Marchdale, it is scarcely civil to tell Sir Francis to his face that he resembles a vampire. I must, I must. 
"'Pray, sir,' interrupted Varney to Marchdale, "'permit Mr. Bannerworth to speak here freely. "'There is nothing in the whole world I so much admire as candor.' "'Then you so much resemble the vampire,' added Henry, "'that, that I know not what to think.' "'Is it possible?' said Varney. "'It is a damning fact.' "'Well, it's unfortunate for me, I presume. "'Ah!' Varney gave a twinge of pain, "'as if some sudden bodily ailment had attacked him severely. "'You are unwell, sir?' said Marchdale. "'No, no, no,' he said. "'I hurt my arm, and happened accidentally "'to touch the arm of this chair with it.' "'A hurt?' said Henry. "'Yes, Mr. Bannerworth. "'Uh, a wound?' "'Yes, a wound, but not much more than skin-deep. "'In fact, little beyond an abrasion of the skin. "'May I inquire how you came by it?' "'Oh, yes, a slight fall.' "'Indeed.' "'Remarkable, is it not? Very remarkable. "'We should know a moment when, for some most trifling cause, "'we may receive some serious bodily hurt.' How true it is, Mr. Bannerworth, that in the midst of life we are in death. And equally true, perhaps, said Henry, that in the midst of death there may be found a horrible life. Well, I should not wonder. There are really so many strange things in this world that I have left off wondering at anything now. There are strange things, said Henry. You wish to purchase of me the hall, sir? If you wish to sell, you, you are perhaps attached to the place? Perhaps you recollected it, sir, long ago? Not very long, smiled Sir Francis Varney. It seems a nice, comfortable old house, and the grounds, too, appear to be amazingly well wooded, which, to one of rather a romantic temperament like myself, is always an additional charm to a place. I was extremely pleased with it the first time I beheld it, and a desire to call myself the owner of it took possession of my mind. The scenery is remarkable for its beauty, and from what I have seen of it it is rarely to be excelled. No doubt you are greatly attached to it. It has been my home from infancy, returned Henry, and being also the residence of my ancestors for centuries, it is natural that I should be so. True, true. The house, no doubt, has suffered much, said Henry, within the last hundred years. No doubt it has. A hundred years is a tolerable long space of time, you know. It is indeed. Oh, how any human life which has spun out to such an extent must lose its charms by losing all its fondest and dearest associations. Ah, uh, how true, said Sir Francis Varney. He had some minutes previously touched a bell, and at this moment a servant brought in on a tray some wine and refreshments. End of chapter 13 Recording by Roger Moline